Throughout the middle decades of the 20th century, watch manufacturers experimented with and attempted to implement many of the different styles of watch case design. The 1930s saw Art Deco tonneau and rectangular cases. Next came the elegant teardrop lugs of the 1940s. Asymmetric and artistic designs followed during the 1950s and the 1960s. But by the end of that decade, a fashion for ergonomic forms was taking hold. Case design evolved mainly through the simple time-only watches, the Calatrava forms for Patek, for example. Perhaps because a simple watch face that could not detract from the case design, including complications would only have inhibited the possibilities, although there were exceptions. But the 1950s and the 1960s also saw some of the most innovative and collectible forms of watch designs produced. The future and futuristic designs have become part of popular culture. From cars and other household implements to popular television series and the proliferation of science fiction movies. Dan Dare, pilot of the future, was not simply a vision of travel in years to come. It set a trend in design. In order to incorporate these daring new aesthetics, watch manufacturers turned to outside designers. Rather than use the in-house and largely anonymous design teams, the 1950s and the 1960s saw the first examples of specialized designers from other fields being brought in to influence watch design. The Hamilton Watch Company in the US was arguably the first to hire a designer from outside the watch industry when it recruited Richard Arbib. Arbib was a renowned car designer. His Packard, Pan American, had won first place as a design car for the International Motor Show in New York in 1952. By 1955, Arbib was working for the American Motor Corporation, or AMC, designing the Hudson Hornet with its famed V-form throughout the car. He also used to do cover illustrations for Galaxy Science Fiction, an American magazine that was launched in 1950. The same V Science Future design themes can be seen in Arbib's Hamilton Ventura watch. This asymmetric design was implemented with their first electronic watch movement in 1957 and found a fan in Elvis Presley. Other manufacturers experimented more cautiously with futuristic designs. One example was one of the most venerated Swiss watch firms, Patek Philippe. Throughout the 1950s, in very small quantities, Patek had been producing innovative and unique case designs. The Patek 2546 is a case in point. Rather than using teardrop lugs, the shape is inverted so that the line of the bezel loops around into the shape of a teardrop that creates a teardrop cavity rather than the teardrop itself. The design is both modern and Baroque in form, and the complex case forms were sufficiently difficult to manufacture that only small numbers of the watch were made. These early experiments in design also inspired watchmakers to take watch design closer to the world of decorative arts. By 1960, Patek appointed a specialized designer at the head of their design department. Gilbert Albert, who had trained in jewelry and design at Geneva's École des Arts Industrielles. By the age of 25, he was working at Patek Philippe, where he soon became head of its workshop. During the seven years he spent there, he created some of the most daring designs, notably the asymmetric models from the Ricochet series. Inspired by artists such as Brancusi and Mondrian, his unusual yet timeless designs are considered as cutting edge and unconventional today as they were when first produced more than half a century ago. Albert was at Patek only a short time, but his visually arresting designs and their asymmetric and angle cases are becoming highly sought after and collectible. In 1962, he opened his own jewelry workshop in Geneva, and in 1991, he became the first living artist since 1917 to be invited to show his creations in the Kremlin in Moscow. But it was not only Swiss manufacturers that were looking at changing the design and the aesthetics of the watch. In 1959, Tokyo-based watch firm Seiko hired a young design graduate named Taro Tanaka, who went on to create a style that adhered to the rules which he labeled grammar of design. Tanaka had an interest in jewelry, particularly in the way stones were cut and polished, and he wanted the watches he designed to reflect this. First, he concluded that the best way to reflect light was to ensure that every surface, not just the dial, but the hands, the indices, and the case was perfectly flat. Second, he believed in a plain bezel, a simple two-dimensional faceted curve. Third, 
He refused to tolerate any sort of visual distortion. Fourth, both the dial and case were to be finished to a mirror-like shine. And fifth, there would be no more standard round cases. Instead, each and every one was to be unique. That philosophy governs Seiko watches to this day. Other manufacturers with their own design teams were also experimenting with case design at that time. Vacheron Constantin introduced their Chronometer Royale and Audemars Piquet produced an array of asymmetric case designs. For the most part, the era saw a separate development of dress watches and of sports or professional watches. The other aspect of design for watches in the 1950s was the continued development of watches for a purpose. In particular, the 1950s saw the advent of the professional dive watch. A similar watch was developed quite independently by two different manufacturers. We've seen how Rolex began to develop water-resistant watches. It also worked on dive watches for military use, helping a small Italian firm in Florence, Officina Panerai, develop cushion-shaped watches as depth-rated instruments. With help from Rolex, Panerai developed the first professional dive watches. René Paul Jeanneré, a director of Rolex and a keen amateur diver, has suggested to Wilsdorf that Rolex could develop a watch that was suitable for use in the water. In collaboration with his friend, Jacques-Yves Cousteau, the diver, explorer, and early champion of marine conservation, jean Ray convinced the Rolex board to back the new watch, and the Rolex Submariner was launched, featuring a moving bezel and a luminosity that enabled the dial to be read at depths of up to 100 meters. The other important dive watch of that period was the Blanc Pan 50 Fathoms, which was developed separately, but included a number of the same design details, including the rotating bezel and the dial layout. Longpan was then a small firm headquartered in Villeray, Switzerland. Its chief executive at the time, Jean-Jacques Fichte, was another amateur diver who received a request in 1952 from the newly formed French Navy Commando Unit, headed by Lieutenant Claude Riffaut and Captain Robert Bob Malbier of the French Overseas Intelligence Agency, SDECE, which stood for Service de Documentation Exterior et de Contre-Espionage. The new dive watch was introduced at the Basel Watch Fair in 1953.